Well, welcome to uh, the first panel session at the Midwestern History Association Conference uh, held in conjunction with the Howenstein Center. And we are delighted at this early uh, panel to launch a new book that has a lot to do with uh, the origins and, and functioning of the Midwestern Studies movement over the last few years. One of the central questions we're trying to answer in Midwestern Studies is what is the Midwest? What are the boundaries of it? What are we talking about? What geographic space? And so there have been a number of initiatives launched to define those boundaries. And the first big payoff of those efforts is this new book called The Interior Borderlands, which is uh, designed to explore the dividing line between the Midwest and the Great Plains or the broader West. And so um, this is the first of these uh, sorts of books. There will be a book coming out from Michigan State University in a year or so about the northern borderlands. Uh, there's a book in the works uh, that Gleaves Whitney and I are working on uh, with Kent State University Press. Uh, the call for papers is still open on that book. And that will be on where the Midwest uh, separates from the East. So uh, Kent State is the perfect publisher for that. And uh, stay tuned, there's going to be an initiative focused on the southern borderlands, uh, which I think will be probably uh, the most interesting book, and it will engage the most scholars given the size and scope of southern history. So we are lucky today to have four of our authors who contributed to the interior borderlands uh, here today, and we're going to hear from them. Uh, before we do that, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the Center for Western Studies at Augustana University, uh, which sponsored uh, this book and coordinated this book. And in particular, I want to recognize Dr. Harry Thompson, the director of the center, who was very interested in this project and helped us along uh, throughout the last few years. Our next project with the Center for Western Studies is a cultural history of the Big Sioux River Valley. Uh, the Big Sioux River runs through Sioux Falls and on down to Sioux City and connects with the Missouri River. It's an understudied river valley. It hasn't been, uh, there's not been a book uh, ever written about it. Uh, so we're going to break the seal and uh, plunge in and join all these other amazing river books that have been coming out in recent years about Midwestern rivers and other rivers. So let's uh, begin. I believe our first speaker is Mike. Is that correct? According to the, uh, um, I didn't yeah, look here. You tell me who's first. Okay, so Mike Mullen, professor of history at Augustana University, where the Center for Western Studies is located, who published this book. So please welcome Mike. I'm glad we're in a classroom so that I can see how much time uh, has gone by. So my chapter is on how people perceive, could we draw a map that defines, delineates the Midwest from the Great Plains? And if you think about the encyclopedias that have come out in the last 10, 15 years, the Midwest and the Great Plains have the same map, basically, the same drawing. And so I. I was curious about this, whether it's the Midwest Encyclopedia or the Great Plains Atlas, it's basically the same map. So I sent uh, a survey to every department chair in an English department, a geography department, and a history department in 11, 13 states, I forget how many, you just looked and said, Ariel, right, what's, what's the boundary here? And asked them to fill out a survey much the way Walter Nugent did in 1992. I now know why the encyclopedias have the same map. It did not, <laughs> did not clarify what, what I had hoped to do, but it did clarify something really important, and that is the notion of perspective, the role of history and of literature in our composition of what the Great Plains is or what the Midwest is. That is, short geographers were great. Short grass, tall grass. Historians were interesting because they do not include, for the most part, Missouri. 
as the Midwest because of its slave experience, its historical presence. They understand it grows the same crops, it has the same settlement patterns, but slavery to many of them precludes Missouri from being part of that question. Interestingly, there was not a lot of discussion about slavery in Oklahoma among the Cherokee, but I just attribute that to not thinking about Oklahoma uh, in much the same way. Texas, right, is, is always that boundary. So this study shows in both image and in survey answers the differences between geographers, historians, and English professors as they look at the Great Plains, as they look at the Midwest, how they perceive their region. And it's really important. It also has um, James Sturridge, I hope I pronounced that right, a geographer's work who did a similar study, different set of questions, with undergraduates. And that undergraduate study, taken over a number of years, differs in some profound ways from what I found in my survey. Um, Sturridge appears repeatedly in this set of essays, um, and, and with good reason. You, you do have to kind of use his work. Um, and, and so that's what I attempted to do. And I did not come up with definitive boundaries, much to my chagrin. But what I would like to do next with this study is, and I talked to Scott St. Louis about this, is I would like to take this initial study and then compare it with a survey of Midwestern History Association members to see if they define the region. Because I did not differentiate an English chair who might have been a Europeanist from a, a, a department chair who's a, a, a Willa Cather scholar. I, I didn't do that. But it, if you belong to Midwestern history, you should have a sense or be interested in be writing for the most part in these areas. And I think that would be the next step in, in what I wrote about. That is to see if those who belong to an association who see themselves as rooted or doing scholarship in the region, see the, see the regions as different than what we might call the educated layperson. And so I think there's a second phase to, to the project that I did. It, 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 it can stand as a one-off, but it does not have to stand on a one-off. And so I think that would be the next step in, in the research that I did. So I did this survey. I did not come to the great conclusions that Walter Nugent did in 1992. Uh, but I did find that the history matters, that the literature matters. Um, and we heard at the first presentation, you know, the, the flown over states. One of the things that's really missing, I think, or comes across in my study, is what is the, the state of, not isolation, but of a small population that is ignoring the large cities in the Midwest or the Great Plains. How do we get at the population, the people that are there. Why are they staying? What are they doing? Are they different? And that, I think, is something that, that would be quite fascinating uh, for a, a future conversation, a future, future topic. Um, I, I wasn't really quite sure what, what we were to do here. Uh, you know, I, that is, I didn't write it out. I've got another presentation that I, I was thinking about at, at 1.30. But uh, maybe. I can tell you some of the questions. Maybe that would be the best way, and, and you can get a, get a quick, quick sense of it. And you can see these kind of maps, maps in the back. Um, of course, now that I'm looking for the questions. So the survey uh, asked among, you know, where you, where you did your graduate work from? Was it in the Midwest? Was it not? Uh, where are you located? What's your discipline? Uh, what other organizations might you belong to? other than, than Midwestern history, American Historical Society, American Historical Society of Geographers, um, uh, Midwest, I actually had the Mid, I, originally the Midwestern Advertising Association said I could survey their members, because I thought it'd be interesting to see how they market the areas. And as soon as I sent them the questionnaire, they, they never responded back and they didn't send it out. So originally they were gonna participate, but they chose not to. Um, how would you describe the boundaries yourself? Um, what are the characteristics that set 
the Midwest apart from the Great Plains, if you're in the Midwest, if, it, if you're in the Great Plains, what separates the Great Plains from the Midwest? What are your perceptions? Uh, how do you know when you've left the region? The opening chapter, I think it's chapter one, John's chapter talks about driving west and, and doing that. Uh, can you make a case? And then what, what struck me is can or was your region attached to another region at some point? I think this is particularly problematic for the Great Plains, right? Because the Great Plains, if you look at, at, at Doug Hurt's book, right, is a Western map. When he draws his Great, his, his great Plains, it's the West writ large, right? So how do you differentiate that? That's why geographers with their short grass prairie kind of make, make that division. Um, what criteria would you use for being different, for your region being different from the other? Uh, and how do you know when you left it? My favorite, only probably because I remember it was, uh, I know I've left the Great Plains when I begin to see Denver Broncos caps. <laughs> right? Now I'm in the West, that that, that person wrote. Uh, and then they were asked to draw a boundary. And it was from that that I then summarized their, their findings, what they, what, what they thought of as the regions, and, and how they drew it. Um, not a surprise. As, as did Walter Nugent, uh, most did not continue the Great Plains into, into Canada or, or into Mexico. I think it's just, it's not that they didn't think they belonged, it's just that they didn't, didn't do that. So they were thinking particularly the United States. Um, and, and, and that's what I did. Uh, I, I do think that there's more between the two, the Great Plains and the Midwest. I think there's a lot of common ground uh, between the two, um, and that might be worth exploring as opposed to separation. But uh, it, it was an interesting exercise. I think if I could do it again, I'd refine it a little bit more. Uh, and I am thankful to Matthew Fox in our Institute of Technology Department because he's the one who really did the background to allow the technology to draw the map and, and so I can overlay the responses. And there are roughly 60, 70 responses, somewhere in that number. So not a great turnout, but better than credit card solicitations. Uh, and enough that you can kind of draw your um, some conclusions. So I, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker before she comes up, before Mara comes up, I wanted to give a plug for Robert Carroll's new book, uh, Working. He has a chapter in there about when he would leave New York and go to the hill country of Texas, out west of Austin. And he describes the sort of culture shock and the differences. I mean, this is a kind of an extreme case from New York City, from Manhattan to the hill country. But this kind of uh, regional differentiation is the kind of thing we're trying to capture in this book. All right, our next uh, speaker is Mara Ionides from Missouri State University. Thanks, Mara. I guess I, I should begin by, by thanking John for not excluding Missouri from the Midwest. <laughs> um, Missouri State is in Springfield, Missouri, which is in the southwest corner of Missouri. It's also in the Ozarks, and so I'm always making the argument, the Ozarks is the south, but I'm in Missouri, so I'm in mid the Midwest. So it's always that argument of borders are permeable and changeable. Um, so thank you for not excluding us. I appreciate I that. Send, I did send my survey to Missouri. Thank you. University. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I wanted to start um, with a quote from my friend and scholar um, of American Jewish history, Amy Hill Shevitz, who says, Jews have been in perpetual encounter with other peoples in a way Jews have always lived in a borderland. And my, my chapter was on the Jewish experience in the Midwest and how, is, how did Jews define that landscape um, or place, I'm not quite sure, again, we're still in that, what do we call it, um, experience. And my conclusion from reading various materials is that it's really regional based, it's actually economically based. So um, to begin with, the first wave of Jewish immigration to North America, um, as Jewish scholars define 
American Jewish history, which is different than American historians define American history, just so you know that. Jewish scholars like to use the concept of waves. Um, American historians define things, as I like to say, by wars. We're very embattled. <laughs> and American Jewish scholars like this, this C word concept. So the first wave of immigration is from 1624 to the 1820s. And those Jews who define themselves as American, whether born in America or not, right, because you're looking at the early history and a lot of people were immigrants, settled on the edges of the Midwest, as did most people, right? Illinois, Missouri, I'm going to include Wisconsin. There were Canadian Jews who came across the border, um, um, Michigan and Indiana. They define themselves as Americans. They were mostly immigrants, but not all, and they went into business. They were such a small minority in the United States, 0.03% of the American Jewish population, that they were totally overlooked, totally ignored, which worked to their advantage because their presentation became positive or neutral for American Jewry. Christians viewed them as either not relevant or in a positive way because they had good experiences with them. And I think this is very significant for the future. The second wave of Jewish immigration is to the United States is from 1820 to the 1880s, right? The part of that German immigration. They came for the same reason Christian Germans came. They came for economic, prof economic opportunity and to avoid the civil wars that were going on. Um, they came as merchants. They had been merchants in the old country. They were merchants in the new country. They came with some money. They came with education, which meant that most of them were bilingual. Maybe not English, but once you're bilingual, picking up more languages becomes far simpler. And they were middle class. They came with middle class expectations and wanted to be part of the American middle class. In 1820, there were 2,600 Jews estimated to be in the United States. In 1840, there were estimated to be 15,000 Jews in the United States. So you can see that this influx was enormous, although it only made them 0.04% of the American population because there were so many other Germans coming. <clears throat> What's interesting is that the population of a lot of Midwestern towns that were growing at this point were also German. They were Christian German. That meant that these Jewish Germans who were arriving were considered Germans. Religion was not important. They had a common culture, they had a common language, and so they were accepted into the community. So we're still at this point where anti-Semitism is negligible, <clears throat> not really obvious. <coughs> um, to give you an example, in 1850, a study shows that in Wisconsin, the first language of the majority of the people was German. Right? So these German Jewish immigrants were part of the German community. They viewed themselves that way. The Christian Germans viewed them that way. German Jews did not go to towns that were not readily accessible. So again, they remained on that kind of outskirts of the Midwestern world, okay, until the railroads arrived. So now we're starting to talk right just before the Civil War, just after the Civil War, when railroad expansion came because every so many miles there had to be a town because trains had to refuel. The moment there's a town, a merchant wants to arrive. German Jews had the experience and often some of the money, and so they would arrive and start a community there. But these communities remained quite small. German, these German Jewish communities remained small in these small towns. When you have, add the number of people from the third wave of Jewish immigration, that's from the 1880s to about 1916, right, till the First World War. <coughs> These were Russian Jews. When we say Russian Jews in quotes, they were Eastern European Jews classified 
right, in, in statistics as Russian Jews. Um, and they were fleeing anti-Semitism. They were not coming for necessarily economic reasons. They were coming for safety. So it's a very different experience. Um, and they were very different than the German Jews that were here. So the German Jews that came were middle class, right? They had some money. The Russian Jews were not middle class. They were mostly poor. They were mostly secularly uneducated. They had religious education, but not a secular education. They didn't speak German, English, or French. They spoke Russian and Yiddish, or Ukrainian Yiddish, or Polish and Yiddish, right? The community language and Yiddish. And so they couldn't reach out in the same way that the German Jews had. But it, they caused the largest increase. They were the largest immigration group ever and the largest immigration experience for the American Jews, right? So we have in 1880, the Jewish population of the United States was 0.5%. In 1920, they were 3.6% of the American population. Again, we're not talking that they're a majority here by any means, but you can see that they're gone from a negligible minority to a countable minority. Um, what happens is the German Jewish experience in America is one of acceptance. They are middle class, they have middle class values, they speak English, and they had uh, already had a reformation, to use a common term minology, of Judaism. They had, con they had secularized, readjusted Judaism, so it was more acceptable to Christians and Christian culture. The Russian Jews had not done this. So they were coming as poor, secularly uneducated, or if they were secularly educated, they were coming as <coughs> socialists, i.e. radicals, okay? And they were following traditional Judaism strictly, those who were not socialists. This frightened the German Jews because they had lived with little anti-Semitism, and now they see that this different community is going to bring in anti-Semitism. And so what did they do? They sent the, German, the Russian Jews to the unpopulated Midwest, right? They had read the news reports. There was nobody in the Midwest. Send them west. Um, and they actually created funds to help them go, just go away. Um, most of these Russian Jews, again, went to urban areas or to towns, and they worked in businesses, whether they were employees or opened their own, right? Even there are lots of examples of handicraftsmen, right? Shoemakers, cigar makers, right? They would go and open a business or work for another business. There was a very small number of Jews who became farmers. Most of these opened communal farms and they all failed. Let's not get too excited. The communal farms under a group called Am Olam, which were really secular, those failed. There were a few people who went to uh, North Dakota, the Devil's Lake area, to farm, and they were moderately successful, although most of them sold out and later moved to town. What does this mean to the study of the Midwest and borders? It means that to the majority of Jews, the Midwest is the Midwest is the Midwest. It's this land in the middle. I'm just going to say the flyover, but I've learned better now. It's this land in the middle where you go to be a merchant, just like you would be if you were on the East Coast or the West Coast, except it's not there. The only difference is for those who went to the Dakotas, it was farmland. That is the entire difference. It was economic opportunity. There was no other reason, John left us, there was no other reason to go. So you went to farm if you went to the Dakotas, otherwise you were just looking for a place to start a store so you could support your family. Um, it was not until the Russian Jewish expansion that really Jewish communities were created, right? So it wasn't until the 
60s, 70s, 80s, that you start seeing congregations, religious congregations being formed, cemeteries being created. Because it wasn't until then that the communities were large enough to establish these experiences. That's not to say that they weren't worshiping and weren't burying their dead, but they weren't big enough to create an established, um, articulated community. I'm done, John. Thank you, Mara. Okay. Next up is Gleaves Whitney, the director of the Howenstein Center, where we are having this uh, launch party today. And uh, Gleaves is uh, a trained geographer, so he knows a lot about these spatial questions and has been thinking a lot about them and the differences between places like Texas, like Cairo, as a native Texan, native Texan. and uh, what it's like here in the Midwest. So please welcome Gleaves Whitney. Thank you, John, very much. And I just got to give another shout out, shout out to John. Um, I know he got one on C-SPAN, but uh, when John and I first started talking about the Midwestern History Conference six years ago up in Macosta, Michigan, this guy's a great salesman, but I realized more than that, he really was launching an academic revolution, a, a, a renaissance of Midwestern studies, Midwestern history that I thought was phenomenal. With, uh, and we had had Drew Caton speak independently years before in a War and Empire conference, but I, I just really appreciate the ability of John to network all of these uh, great minds who are working on the problems of you know, reviving Midwestern history in a meaningful way. So John, thank you so much, and thank you for all of you who have come to participate. We're up to 180, 190 participants this year, so it's really been a phenomenal experience. Well, when John first invited me to contribute a chapter to this uh, volume, I, my academic training is actually European intellectual history. I'm more in your camp, I think, <laughs> in a lot of the studies. So, uh, you know, reading about Marx and you know, really interesting folks than uh, being a, a Midwestern scholar. But I was so appreciative. I, uh, my, it turns out my first book that I had published back in 1983 dealt with vertical transition zones. Those transitions were along the Colorado Front Range, right where the Great Plains end, and the Front Range of the Colorado Rockies rise up. So I was looking at transition zones from 5,000 feet elevation around the Mile High City, Denver, all the way up to 14,000 feet, some of the mountains that I was climbing. And it turns out there are four major transition zones, and you really do see uh, cultural changes as well. It's not all uniform. And I thought, what a challenging, what a wonderful invitation now to think about the transition zone. You know, take that verticality and now lay it out horizontally. What are the transition zones then from the Missouri River, say, all the way to the, uh, the front range of the Rockies? I also spent a number of years in Fort Collins, Colorado, well, in several cities along the front range. And it occurred to me there, and I'd come there basically from the Gulf Coast, we were talking about Texas, it occurred to me there that Colorado, a lot of the Coloradans, this might be interesting to you, Michael, but a lot of the Coloradans that I was around had brought so much of the Midwest with them. And so I, not knowing the Midwest, I had spent hardly any time in the Midwest, I kind of felt as though I were in a Midwestern outlier in cities like Fort Collins or Greeley or Boulder before it became, you know, so identified with the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. So I kind of it had the Midwestern flavor in the Great Plains. So I knew that this project, to, to contribute a chapter to this volume, would be extremely challenging and, and test a lot of assumptions. And then once I moved to Michigan to go to grad school, I was driving back and forth between Colorado, probably ended up making 60 trips in all between uh, when I first moved to uh, Ann Arbor and uh, then uh, started working on this chapter. So I thought a lot just driving. You know, what are the differences here in these regions? And so I had fun, because of my training in intellectual history, constructing and deconstructing. I mean, that's kind of what intellectual history historians have been doing the last four decades, at looking at the constructions and then the deconstructions. We all, everybody in this room knows about the constructions of a transition zone that is intellectually coherent. You know, you can look at the, for example, the, the landscape itself is less glaciated as you move 
west and south of the Missouri River. It's more glaciated as you get toward Ohio, increasingly so. You can look at the obvious um, rainfall patterns and the impact that has had on moving from dry land, or, or if you're going from, from uh, east to west, from the, the farming in the, the uh, forest parklands and the tall grass prairie parklands to the short grass prairie, something Michael went into. Um, all of these, you know, the, the density of human services and population is an obvious one. If you, if you talk to people, for example, in a medical field and listen to how they describe the, the fuel costs for hospitals and how to get out to, to distant farms and ranches uh, in the Great Plains vis-a-vis -vis the Midwest. It's striking. I mean, people like that think about these things, and it's important to take that into consideration. But in terms of constructing, there were two things that I came down to for constructing borderlands that I thought were very, very telling. One was the composite satellite photograph of the United States at night. It is striking. If you look at, at a, the light pattern, the energy pattern, you see, uh, let me go to my notes here, but you see the density of light, the, the density of electrically generated lights in the Midwest is very high versus the lower density of lights in the Great Plains, and it's roughly between longitudes 97 and 99 degrees west. You, you can trace it down from Grand Forks and Fargo in the north down through Sioux Falls uh, to Lincoln, Salina, and Hutchinson in the south, and it's so distinct. It really stands out to you. You have to deal with that existential fact that there is definitely an energy transition zone there, civilizational energy. And it, it made the, the line occurred to me that it, it makes you go back to, it's, it's tempting to go back to Major Stephen Long's description of the difference as, as you move west, you're moving into a great American desert. The lights suggest that. But I changed in a very POMO fashion from desert to dessert because the great American desert is actually because the Great Plains, the High Plains, are so much part of our consciousness of beginning in the West, of what is the West. So I'm calling it the Great American Desert. For, and, and I'm not even a great fan of postmodernism, but I thought I, I would appropriate it. And the second thing that really occurred to me in constructing a transition zone between the Midwest and the Great Plains came from my training in intellectual history of, of Edmund Burke's distinction between the beautiful and the sublime. And the more I started reading accounts of people going west or people coming up from the southwest going east, so for example, the Coronado Expedition, but the Oregon Trail folks moving from east to west, the more I realized there was a significant psychological change. All the accounts that you read, you know, in the Midwest, if you have a storm such as this, there's a sense of shelter that one can, can escape to. There's a sense, you know, the trees, uh, the rivers won't necessarily flash flood on you. Uh, there, there are a lot of ways that you can find shelter in the arbors. Ann Arbor, for example, even reveals this. That's considered beautiful. If you read the terminology, the, the way people describe this part of the country is in terms of beautiful, bountiful. As you move west, there's a sense of terror. So a storm like this comes across, there is no place to go. Because first of all, obviously, it's short grass prairie with very few trees. If you do decide to run down to the cottonwood trees in the water courses, there's a sense of the real danger of flash floods as the people moving west discovered. So there's a psychological component here, and we know it. We know it when we drive. If there's something different about it, if you're, if you're stopping in eastern Kansas, which is beautiful and rural, Kansas is not flat. Eastern Kansas is not flat. You stop there to fill up your car. It's beautiful. And it's that sense of the, the beauty, in the words I'm using now. And you just know when you get out of the car in western Kansas, along, somewhere along the Republican River, say, it's sublime. It's overpowering the sky and that powerful landscape that is so filled, apparently, with danger. And then I went, had fun with deconstructing. I want to race through this, because my main point, um, I want to actually quote from the chapter, but the, the deconstructing exercise was actually pretty easy. I, I, decon I was surprised by how easy it was to deconstruct any human thought boundaries between the Midwest and the Great Plains. I mean, just, just to go into one little trope I use here, 
Look at Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays. You know, uh, Saturdays, Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays. Saturdays on the, the uh, whether you're in eastern Kansas or western Kansas, as, as David just said to me uh, before we started, state boundaries don't matter. When you're, when you're in the, the Midwest part of Kansas, vis-a-vis -vis the uh, eastern place, Saturdays, Cornhus uh, uh, Jayhawks or Jayhawks. Same in Nebraska, Cornhuskers or Cornhuskers, with equal intensity across whatever perceived physiological or ecological or ethnographic boundary zone there is. That's Saturdays, they go to the games, they tune in. Sundays, denomination, denominationally, they go to the same churches across that transition. I imagine your research showed the same thing in these farming communities, uh, Mara. Uh, Mondays, they go to a job that is perceived anyway to be basically within the economic web of the imperial city of Chicago. And on Tuesdays, they vote the same, overwhelmingly Republican across the state. They have voted the same, for example, now I run a presidential studies center here, so I look at presidential data. They vote the same since 1940, for, except for one time for the Republican candidate and in large numbers. So you can deconstruct these so-called transition zones, and I, I have many more in the, um, in the chapter. Uh, I also found two really interesting outliers that I wanted to focus on. Mara just mentioned an agricultural colony. Well, I looked at what was essentially an eastern, a mid, very Midwestern agricultural colony, Greeley, Colorado, transplanted as far west in the Great Plains as you can get. But it is so thoroughly Midwestern. If you go back and look at, and European, uh, Charles Fourier is the, the French socialist thinker, a communal thinker who inspired this colony of Greeley. But if you look at Nathan Meeker and the people from Ohio and Indiana, and places definitely rooted in the Midwest who all settled in Greeley. This is what I was sensing when I first moved from Texas and the Gulf Coast to Colorado, that there was a Midwestern mindset in these front range cities and in these agricultural colonies. Look at their street names. They're trees transplanted from the Midwest and Eastern forests. You're not talking about saguaro cactus. You know, it's Elm Street and, and that kind of thing. Maple Boulevard. And then if you look going the other direction, the outlier of the Great Plains that's found really in a very uh, perceived Midwestern area, it's the Flint Hills. And that's where I was really on firm territory. Driving around the Flint Hills, I saw that there was a, basically the more I delved into the research when I went to Kansas State University and looked in their archives, I, I, there in Manhattan, I found that a lot of the ranchers in the Flint Hills were from Texas and Colorado. They had transplanted the West into the Midwest. So I was having all kinds of fun constructing and deconstructing this. But at the, the end of the day, what I was also working on was establishing something at the Howenstein Center that I call a Common Ground Initiative, trying to do something about the terrible divides that break us apart now and balkanize the American people into tribal areas. And um, if you will indulge me, I don't usually read to gatherings, but if you will indulge me, I wrote something that I, I thought very closely about the language in this. I just would like to read a couple of paragraphs to you. Whatever else they are, the transitions that intermittently weave in, out, and through longitudes 98 and 100 degrees west are not, not so much lines of demarcation as zones of tension not either or, but both and, sharing characteristics of both the Midwest and the Great Plains. Zones of tension. Could such zones of tension help Americans know themselves better? I believe so. The diverse natural and cultural zones between the Midwest and Great Plains unwittingly provide a geographic metaphor for the American experience itself. The notion of a complicated American middle a contested middle of contrasts, contradictions, ironies, polarities, paradoxes, tensions, is well known and much commented on. Does this notion not describe the clash of diverse and sometimes irreconcilable values in a vibrant democracy? Whether conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat, progressive or libertarian, the political challenge Americans perpetually face is how to reconcile such binary values 
when they clash in the political estuary of the public square. I mean, some of the terms that we use, republic versus empire, natural aristocracy versus popular culture, the core back east versus the periphery of the frontier west, liberty versus equality, freedom versus order, individual versus community, private property versus the commons, profit versus that which is priceless. Founding families versus subsequent immigrants, tradition versus novelty, creative destruction vis-a-vis -vis the permanent things. Historically, the majority of Americans have not been ideologues. They have given allegiance neither to the far left nor to the far right, but reside somewhere in the pragmatic middle between the proverbial 40-yard lines. As a people, we have succeeded in keeping the binary values that clash in the public square in dynamic tension. It is a productive tension, not unlike that found in the land and the people in the middle ground where the Midwest and the Great Plains meet and mingle, these borderlands that generate their own zones of dynamic tension, a cultural estuary, as it were, that enriches our understanding precisely because of its dynamic tension. And I conclude with this question. Might the notion of contested and accommodated borderlands be the most characteristic geographic expression of the American idea? So thank you. Thank you, Gleaves. I thought maybe you would talk about Gertrude Stein a little bit because Gertrude Stein is uh, very important to the title of Gleaves's chapter. And uh, in particular, her comment about Oakland, there is no there there, which is widely misunderstood. Yes. What Gertrude Stein was saying was not that Oakland is this vacant place where nothing happens and nothing ever happened. What she's saying is when she grew up there, it was a wonderful place of rooted people and connected people and an actual um, interconnected community. And that community had faded away. The old there that she knew as a child had disappeared. Uh, but that's another good reason to read Gleaves' chapter in the book. Our next uh, contributor to the book is David Pekaski, who is a professor at uh, Southwest State University in Minnesota, uh, which for many, many years had a regional studies center. I think, unfortunately, it's not operable anymore. We'll talk about that this afternoon. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Uh, but if I could make one recommendation about David's many books, Take a look at his book titled Rooted, uh, published by University of Iowa Press. And it's about the regional identification of many writers from this part of the country and how important the Midwest was to their development and to their uh, literary works. But it's a wonderful work, and I hope it gets wider circulation. So take it away, David. Yeah, I brought the book because it occurred to me uh, driving over here, I did rooted seven Midwest writers of place, but one of the writers is Linda Hazelstrom from West River, South Dakota. So I don't know whether this book is about Midwest or Plains. I haven't figured that out. And then on the way up here on, what was I on? Uh, 196, mile 59, there's a big billboard out there for uh, Prairie Winds condos. So I think they're they're mixing things back and forth here. Um, some, a couple, I'm in literature, and I wrote on writers in there. Uh, actually, a week ago today, I was at the Duluth Bob Dylan Conference. Guy up there, you'll love this, John. Says, hey, I'm writing this short story. It's about a guy who falls, and he has a concussion, and he wakes up, and he's in the body of a Sioux warrior kid back in uh, 1859 at the Sioux Uprising. Could you look at my story? So his story starts out, you know, he and Doris had just finished that painfully boring drive across the prairie from Sioux Falls to Wall Drugs on their way to vacation at the Black Hills. That painfully boring uh, drive, right? I don't know, and then I, 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 we did one of the signings in a bookstore up there and I bumped into this book Minnesota Off the Beaten Path, 
and it divides Minnesota into areas, and one of them is prairie land, which is what I wrote about and talked about. And uh, it, it's a, a state known for thousands of lakes and miles and streams and rivers and acres of wetlands and woodlands. This region of Minnesota presents travelers with an anomalous landscape. It resembles the open spaces of the Dakotas more than the forested hills of eastern Minnesota. It doesn't seem as if prairie land even belongs to the state. <laughs> so that's, that's what they had to say, right? And um, I, I actually started my essay with, with a, a book by Bill Holm, The Music of Failure. And he's got an essay in here which is pretty often quoted where he talks about maybe Southwest Minnesota, and that's where, that's where I'm going with this in terms of the writers of that area. Uh, Southwest Minnesota belongs to the, to the prairies and the plains and not to the Midwest. But he starts out with a very interesting idea, okay? Uh, Holmes says there are two eyes in the human head, okay? There's the eye of mystery, the eye of truth, the hidden, the open, the woods eye or the city eye, and the prairie eye. The prairie eye, and he uses the word prairie, looks for clarity, distance, and light. The woods eye looks for closeness, complexity, and darkness. The prairie eye looks for usefulness and plainness in art and architecture. The woods eye looks for the Baroque and the ornamental. And he says one eye is not superior to the other. They exist in both uh, human, in both people, in all, both eyes exist in all people, um, like female and male and light and dark. But he says one eye always seems to dominate. And then he goes on to say, I have a prairie eye. <laughs> so Bill is from down in where I come from, southwest Minnesota. And what I thought I would do is, is take, um, first of all, take the writers from that region. There are, there are a bunch of writers from that area in Holmes' generation and see whether they identified as Midwest or Prairie and then also see what their thinking kind of was. And what Holmes says, and I would say, and they seem to bear out, uh, the eye and the characteristics, okay? Uh, a preference for experience over theory. A preference for experience over theory. A preference for the visual and the usually horizontal. Uh, they tend to put pictures in their books and they're all like this sort of stuff. Uh, a voice that reflects the place where they live and write. Uh, a vague sense of a lost pastoralism and an awareness or affection even for the dark side. They even have an affection for that dark side. It can be dangerous, but it opens the doors to strength and adventure. So um, I tracked the, those uh, ideas, through uh, the ideas in the language through writers in the region. That would be Robert Bly, not Carol Bly, she's from Duluth, uh, Paul Grukow, Howard Moore, Leo Dangle, Tom Hennon, Faye Sullivan, Dave Joyce. There's a whole bunch of writers came from that little corner down in southwestern Minnesota. Um, I, I, I tracked references in their works. Do they identify themselves as being from the Middle West or as being from the Plains? And they all say they're, they're Prairie Plains. And uh, some of them actually say, no, we, we are not Midwest, we are Prairie Plains. Uh, I picked up examples uh, in their work of the eye that sees what it sees and not what the brain imagines. Um, Don DeLillo, if you know that novel, you know, uh, he's, he's white noise. It's set in the Midwest, but it's, it's very uh, inventive, and you would not get that kind of a novel from the writers of this particular place. Uh, I, I quoted, I don't know if you know, Robert Bly's, uh, but it's probably one of his most famous poems. <laughs> How strange to giving, think of giving up all ambition. Suddenly I see with such clear eyes the white flake of snow that has just fallen on the horse's mane. And that would be the vision from our area, the white flake of snow that has fallen on the horse's mane. Uh, delicacy, a detail. Uh, I used Howard Moore's book, How to Talk Minnesotan, 
and I tracked the language, what Howard Moore, Howard Moore lives in Cottonwood down the, down the road. And then just today I picked up a, a book, How to Talk Midwestern, you know. And that says about Southwest Minnesota here, um, soft-spoken, non-confrontational, as inoffensive as a Methodist sermon. That would be <laughs> Southwest <laughs> Minnesota State. But, but very laid back. Uh, one, of the, one of the poems that I quoted in there, this is Leo Dangle. <laughs> After 40 years of marriage, she tries a new recipe for hamburger hot dish. How did you like it, he asked. She asked. It's all right, he said. This is the third time I cooked it this way. Why can't you ever say if you like something? Well, if I didn't like it, I wouldn't eat it, he said. You can never say that anything I cook tastes good. Well, I don't know why all the time I, you think I have to say it's good. I eat it, don't I? I don't think you have to say all the time it's good, but once in a while you could say you like it. It's all right, he said. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of, of language uh, that you get in, in these sort of writers. Uh, uh, one of my students and I, we found uh, the manuscripts of, of, uh, of this particular book, and we tracked Bill's revisions in the manuscript. And it always goes from a more fancier academic language into something very simple. That's the way he was revising, because he wanted to, to do that sort of stuff. Um, I also generated uh, the mentality, you know, this, this uh, preference for, uh, it's a kind of a curious affection for a not very much of a place. I was talking to the sales rep of one of the, uh, the book places downstairs, and I said, well, well, I got my degree, yes, in, in history, and then I went here and I went there, but, uh, you know, I came home, and I just like my place, and this is where I'm from. And that's kind of the thinking that goes on in there. Um, and, and an affection for the dark side. Paul Grukow is writing, to confront the unknown and meet its challenges is to be admitted to an enlarged world. So our encounters with the wilderness and the darkness widen and free us. I, I don't know, Paul committed suicide, so maybe that's not a very good idea. But it's like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, you know, if you don't get a tornado, you don't get to Oz, and you don't be a big tough girl, right? Um, so the prairie eye and the prairie voice are like a dialect, a sense of traits, um, none of which I suppose are unique, but there's a combination in thought. Uh, and then I tracked uh, some writers after the Holm and Bly and Grukow generation. Um, and uh, I, I tracked some before with, with Herbert Krause and uh, Fred Manfred, and they have the same set of values. The writers afterwards, uh, Mary Bly, David Jowes, Steve Lindstrom, Leif Enger, and I did not find, I saw a kind of uh, annihilation there, kind of what, what Gleave says. Once, once you get into media and TV, um, you kind of lose your sense of place. I found geographical references, but I didn't find the voice, and I didn't find the vision. So uh, I don't know quite what is going to happen with the, with the future of writing and the future of the geography, but anyway, that's kind of what I have been doing with that chapter. Thank you. Thank you, David. And the depictions of the Great Plains of the Midwest and women's fiction, and how women in the Midwest would often return to the Midwest as a home ground or a place to uh, seek solace if they had experienced some sort of trauma, whereas a lot of the women who are describing the Great Plains are fleeing the plains because it's so difficult. And if you read women's agricultural history, I mean, one of the groups that are most resistant to moving to the Great Plains from the well-watered Midwest with lots of trees and green spaces are the women. It's giants uh, in the earth. Yeah, giants in the earth is, is uh, the period on that, the exclamation point on that argument. So uh, let's, so yes, go ahead. I was just going to say the experience of the woman in Centennial, uh, James Mushroom Centennial, out there uh, in what is now the Pawnee Grasslands, and, and she literally goes insane because she cannot keep the dust out from the land. Yes. It's terrible history. Yes. Yeah, we'll look at it. Yes. Like, yeah. 
So can I just add one thing yeah. that, that I, I should have remembered, but I did not, and that is one of the things that came up in the survey, but also in, in the chapters themselves, is there's very little discussion in the region about leaving. And yet that seems to be a theme on both coasts that the Midwest is losing population, that these small towns are dying. But in the responses and in the chapters we're talking about, we're not talking about, in some of them, huge numbers, 0.03%, you know, 3.6% of the people. There doesn't seem to be the concern that is expressed by those flying over, that I could never move there because they're losing population. And, and that it strikes me as something that's worth exploring at some point, somewhere. That is, maybe it goes to the, to the it's my home and so I'm coming back. <laughs> but it also suggests that there's growth and that the story of growth has been missed, both in the Midwest and on the Great Plains. And, and that was something that I, in my conclusion, I talked a little bit about. And I just wanted to mention it because it's something that seems to be on the tip of everyone's tongue. Oh, it's a dying region, or it's this or it's that. But that's not how people in the area see it. And I think that might be one of the voices that needs to be articulated going forward is that that's not how we see our story. We're not going to let you tell our story now. And I know that, that's what the association is trying to do. But it's a really interesting development uh, in just a survey form that this is not an issue when asked, are there some issues that we should be addressing? You know, your observation I think is really interesting because take Grand, ba Grand Rapids. So last night I had to attend an econ club event. Uh, we had about a thousand people in the room. And the event started with all of this really <laughs> bullish rhetoric about what's happening here. I mean, if you rank Grand Rapids in terms of best places to live, best you know, secrets around the world, like one of the 52 great destinations around the world now because of the shores of Lake Michigan, and, and it's kind of just being discovered as this bullish, this, this sort of aggressive bullishness to the coasties. It's like, we defy you to say that we're just flyover country. It's like, you know, look at the families that are now picking up and coming here. And it's true, I mean, there are Californians coming here because they can bring their real estate and they can, they can live like kings and queens here. And so you see, and when I went from Colorado to Michigan back in the 1980s, people thought I was crazy. I mean, with the last person who's leaving Michigan turn out the lights oh, yeah. was the saying back then. And guess who my neighbors are? They're from Colorado. Colorado. <laughs> One last, or go ahead, David. Well, I was uh, on, on the other side, okay, this is about six years ago. I, I had colleagues, I was over in Mongolia, National University of Mongolia for a while. Colleagues, could you send a really smart uh, undergraduate English major to be a native speaker resource person? So I go into American Lit Survey and I pitch this thing. I said, I'll buy you the ticket. They'll send you over to them. Anybody want to go? Farm girl. <laughs> Farm girl. Ro, why do you want to go to Outer Mongolia in front of the whole class? She says, to get the F out of here. <laughs> 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 so she got out of there. But then she comes back, right? I mean, they go out and they come yeah. back and they go out and come back. That's the younger generation. So, Michael, as we're talking about this, which is interesting, the idea of we don't talk about leaving, we talk about staying. And I'm pondering that in light of recent politics and how Midwestern minorities feel, the rise of hate crimes. And I wonder, I think it's a, it's a valuable question, who's staying? Not we're staying, but who of we are staying and who of we are leaving and why? Because I see, I see the fleet. You may not. <laughs> and, and well, the minorities, I think, are. And, and I'm in a big, the biggest city in South Dakota, right? And it's, it's atypical. I'll be the first to admit that Sioux Falls is atypical for South Dakota, much the way Fargo and Bismarck are. So it's a very different. Yeah. Urban, rural. Experience. Yeah, yeah. But it was just interesting because in the survey, asking people, it didn't come up. And it didn't seem to matter whether it was a public institution or a private institution, rural. So, or, so or is this when we turn to John and go, I think there's a book in that, John. Yes, <laughs> there's always a book in that. <laughs> One thing I was going to say before we turn it over to the audience here is that I think during all of these comments by four different, five different people, no one mentioned, uttered the phrase, 100th meridian, which I thought would be 
you know, we'd be discussing where is the line? What do you guys conclude? Where is the dividing point? And no one mentioned Wallace Stegner because, you know, this is a handy rule of thumb. Um, I might put it at the 99th meridian, someone might put it at 101st, but when you are driving west on I-90, I mean, you notice a big difference from when you leave the wooded, green, prosperous looking areas and you get out into the short grass prairie, it gets a little more yellow and brown and flatter and uh, there's fewer stops and there's more cowboy hats and more cows and fewer John Deere's, etc. I mean, there's a real transition zone there. Mm -hmm. And I know some people came to uh, have the question answered, where is the dividing line? But I think 100th Meridian is still, still a good rule of thumb. Uh, my question was still on this idea of staying and leaving, um, to, to go back to that, but I think the minority's point is an excellent one. Um, but I also wonder how much just isn't being talked about the leaving. So for example, uh, this is anecdotal of my own experience, but I grew up in the northwest corner of Iowa, not far from southwest Minnesota. Um, and uh, I left, and I talked to my parents who still live there, and they say, of course you left. We have nothing, you, we, you, you know, our goal is for you to leave, you know, because, because you, we don't have a farm to give you, so you must leave. Right? So they don't, they wouldn't talk about it, but it's the expectation. And I, so there's that in total, but also in my own research of immigrant communities, they would come, they would build themselves up, and then they would hive off and build themselves up. So there's a tradition of leaving that some stay, but many leave. And so you can trace the groups I study across Iowa to Northwest Iowa to Nebraska to Colorado to California. So they don't talk about leaving because they you know, is, is there a sense that they're not They didn't stay. They, they never have stayed. It, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a place to stay, it's a place to be. It's, the, it's both staying and leaving, I would say, right? Like, so right. some groups have stayed, but there's always an expectation that some successful children will leave um, to go get their own farm uh, in my And Dog, a writer, a South Dakota writer, talks about growing up in a small Oak Creek, I think, is the region she grew up in. And she says, you knew in sixth grade at school who was leaving and who was who was staying. And you splintered then, and you do not return to that group again. One, one of the questions I think I see my undergraduates wrestling with is the, the notion of carrying capacity. That is, is the land, was the land built, were there too many people on the land to begin with? That is, modern agriculture doesn't require the numbers, right? That is, yeah. that this, this idea of carrying capacity has not been part of the discussion about population loss or gain. And, and so what, what is the proper number of people for a particular area, a particular region? Uh, that's something that I think I would expect, you know, in 10, 15 years to see as part of a conversation about the Midwest and the Great Plains, about about the region. That is, we're not, we don't have a lot of people, but maybe we have the right number of people. We don't have to have the carrying capacity of New York City. Uh, I just think it's interesting that most of those kids, and I call them kids, I know I shouldn't, students that are, 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 are writing it, are coming from small towns. Chamberlain, South Dakota uh, is, is the one I'm thinking of right now. And they're wrestling with, could I go home even if I wanted to? You know, what would, what, what would there be for me? And so, like you, they don't have a farm. Yes, of course you're going to leave. Yes, you know, the, the Jewish communities have the, the, that same, uh, I kind of call it the, the hop, skip, and jump across right. the country, yeah. right? And uh, their communities, you see this a lot in the South, and, and I've been tracking this in the Midwest, that the small communities in small towns disappear. Because why would they stay? when there's opportunity, Jewish opportunity, forget the economic opportunity, right? And their parents tell them that. I came here to get you an education. I'm not expecting you to come back and run the business. And now I've seen it among, should we say, current college students. They are fleeing sm small town, and I'm putting Springfield in small town because it's a city, but it's a small town attitude. They are fleeing Midwest small town in droves because of hate. And it's the Jews, it's LBGTQ, it's those groups that see themselves as harassed. I mean, even my daughter said, I'm not, my daughter refused to apply to any college in the state of Missouri. Period. I've had it, I'm leaving. Okay. 
<laughs> what do you say to that? Okay. I mean, so I, I see that, and I think that's, I think this is a value that we should be, be examining is who's staying, why are they staying, who's going, why are they going, is it economic, is it um, political, cultural experience, is it because they never thought of themselves as staying anyway? It's Maybe. interesting. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, it's interesting you're saying that because Grand Rapids used to be considered just sort of this Dutch reform enclave, always reliably Republican. and. One of the comments, why is Grand Rapids growing so much and becoming such a desirable city is precisely, I think, addressing what you're saying. It's the diversity, it's the fact that it, it might vote for Obama, you know, and then it, right, I mean, you've seen a, a remarkable uh, change in social attitude here, which I think addresses what you're saying. And, and but I the think cities that don't do that, they, 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 they yeah. flee, right. they, they run right. like mad. And I think, I think, I'm going to turn it back to John and go, I think we need a book on this, John. I want to tell you something. The, the, uh, I think there's an elephant in the room. This is, uh, leaves, this is to you. And the elephant is that the, uh, at the core, the Midwest is really East, historically. And we can't talk about the Midwest. And, and if you think of the Midwest as a place from looking from the east to west and halfway to the west to the Midwest. And if you look then for the person, the, the Midwesterner, and try to find the, the attributes of that Midwesterner, historically it would be Eastern. And the second thing is the diversity, even then, is so great in the Midwest, from the Iron Range to Missouri and so on, that to find the commonalities is like trying to uh, construct a, a, an artificial person because the, uh, the commonalities now, over time, uh, have changed that historical. There's a fellow in, uh, at, at uh, Sioux Falls that did, did research for uh, communities, for uh, small towns, for growth. And in that, he told me that in research he found that after the banks came into Sioux Falls, there was migration patterns and the migration patterns were from the south to Sioux Falls and of people who were not who were not necessarily educated. And he wanted to <coughs> change in the state. The other thing is religion. Religion has, uh, the olden, in the olden days, you had mainline churches. They were big. They were big in the east and big in, the, in Sioux Falls. Uh, those churches have dwindled in their strength they're, they're, as the South has moved north, if you will. Uh, born again and variations of that, the Dutch reform were uh, in, in around Sioux City, north of Sioux City, there's a big Dutch reform uh, group. They're very conservative. That's what Kenya is now. And uh, that group grew in their strength, you know, uh, not political, but social, cultural dominance. And so the elephant is, is there. We cannot get away from the fact that the uh, Midwest does not have a common identity other than it's not South. I mean, because of, of the whole issue of, yeah, of, yeah, of, yeah, of, of the of racial right. issues. But uh, I think that uh, the, the conference should begin to look at the, the links, like your keynote did between the different areas and the differences. So compare and contrast, how is Sioux Falls different than Plattsburgh, New York, 1920s? Right. But then you could begin to see what's really going on. Uh, and that's my, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, what you'd call, uh, I'm going against the grain. I'm an outsider. I'm the, the uh, Mr. Negativeness. But I'm trying to be nice. Just real briefly to respond, because I know we have other questions, but Colin Woodard addresses this question. We've had Colin here, you know, three, four times. In American Nations, he talks about the, the latitudinal migration from East Coast core areas, hearth areas, as it were, and spreading into the Midwest and how they differentiate even in the Midwest. So I, I go back to Colin's good work on that. Thank you. I just wonder, I'd love to hear more about the word borderlands specifically. And Mara, you were the only one who um, addressed that really directly. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, the term borderlands really conjures uh, Gloria Anzaldúa um, and mestiza consciousness um, and kind of uh, negotiating 
that particular experience and also just negotiating um, bifurcation uh, in general. Um, and I, I'm wondering also how that might help us understand some of these questions of leaving and going, especially for um, people who for, are from oppressed communities. I study primarily LGBTQ, primarily transgender uh, Midwest history. And there's a lot of leaving and staying at the same time where the, the migration can actually be a ma can be crucial and life-saving, and it can also be a matter of miles um, from one small town to a slightly bigger one, or from one church to a different church, even in the same location. So I'm just wondering if we can talk about Gloria Anseltua a little bit and what she might add to kind of where, uh, where are the borderlands in the Midwest itself. Well, I was gonna I was gonna add one thing. When you talked about churches and how one goes from one church to the other, one of the most fascinating things I've seen is the words are not gonna come out of my mouth. The synagogue in Springfield, Missouri. I grew up on the East Coast. I'm not, still not used to the synagogue. Is the hub of LGBTQ rel religiosity. Although although the Unitarians are starting to grow on that, mm -hmm. right? Because of acceptance. The majority of, of people who convert, at least in Springfield, from Christianity or nothing to Juda Judaism, they come to Judaism because they're accepted. The, the first homosexual marriage in the city was in the, in the synagogue. Yeah, which is interesting. I mean, you don't think about that. But so the moment you said churches, I was like, I think we need to refine our words there and say houses of worship. Let me speak for the minority. Okay, I'm done now, Joy. <laughs> I appreciate that. Do you have any thoughts on what Gloria Alta do? Like, Having not read, I can't word, say. It really, that word is, has a very particular big trajectory. Have not, I having not read, to. I cannot yes, speak. That's right. Please treat yourself to Gloria Alta Because <laughs> <laughs> she's amazing and is really one of the pivotal introducers of the term borderlands in the U.S. context. Where I run across it is that if I'm actually doing work on meatpacking plants and, and their role, and in the late 80s, early 90s, companies like IBP and others purposely sought out Hispanic workers to mo and moved the plants to rural areas in a desire to split the community. And one of the results is that you see wages are now about 20% less for workers than they were before. And they're now comparable to seasonal construction workers. And there, the, the borderlands, right, is how communities adapt or don't adapt. And it doesn't have to be Hispanics. I'm trying to think of a book on in Iowa about the uh, kosher meatpacking plant. Yes, yes, yes. I, I forget who wrote that and in the, in the struggle that that town had, right? So my, when we're talking about borders, they can be communities not just identities in the sense and how do you work it and what are the results so that's when i think about the borders that's where i'm kind of my research has kind of been focusing on is that interchange how does a community increasingly minority community in a place like sioux falls that's in meat <coughs> how does it interact with the rest of the community and where does that interaction take place my university looks very different than the, i think you'd be surprised 49% of all kindergartners in Sioux Falls are students of color. We do not think Sioux Falls was the whitest city in, South, in, in, in the United States in 1930. There's been very little conversation about that, that change. And, and, and so that's kind of where those conversations need to, to, to take place. But I, I will treat myself to the book, but that's where I'm running across borderlands. And it didn't necessarily fit into to what I was talking about. Thank you. When we were putting together the book, the idea was to tie into this Western history subfield of borderlands and to tap into this idea of a transition zone because there is a difference between the Midwest, as in, say, a traditional Iowa place, and the Great Plains, say, you know, somewhere Greeley or whatever. And we're trying to capture that zone and where the transition takes place. So that was the idea to tap into that whole historiography. Jake? Um, a question for Professor Ryan, please, if I pronounce that correctly. Cohen is cool. Cohen, all right. I like Cohen. All right. Um, 
How did you define, you mentioned a lot of the Jewish farmers right. fail. How did you define failure? Okay, so the Am Olam, who, it, which was a movement um, in Russia, specifically rising out of the popularism at the time, and the idea that we need to break stereotypes of Jews as intellectuals and not, not strong, physically strong, um, they started a number of farms um, over time across the Midwest. Most famously, there are a number in the Dakotas, although the first one was in Louisiana, and the second one was in Newport, Arkansas. Um, the one in Louisiana, I think, lasted for a year. The one in Newport, Arkansas um, lasted nine months with a death rate of, I think, 50%. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and there's a, there's a, a memoir one memoir written on, on that experience and historical fiction looking for a home, just saying, anybody. Um, <laughs> um, in the Dakotas, they lasted for a couple of years. But I mean that in a couple of years, partially mo for, for a number of reasons. One, these people were not farmers. They had no clue what they were doing and they had never experienced this before in their lives. Two, um, the weather was against them. They picked poor places. The community in Newport, Arkansas failed. Why? Because they tried to grow things like wheat in what is now Rice Land, Rice Town. And so clearly they had no clue what they were doing. Now, farmers in areas like uh, Devil's Lake lasted longer because they had a larger community, and, but many of them left, kept their farms but left their farms, right? They moved into town, but they kept their farm because the ideology of I want to grow my own was so strong, right? So they weren't full-time farmers. They were, once they became wealthy enough, they were part-time farmers or, or urban farmers, right? I own it, you farm it um, kind of experience. But these were, the majority of them were not lifetime experiences. Is, is that a good definition? Yeah. I mean, I, this was not something they, I mean, they wished to hand on to their children and they realized in a few years that this wasn't going to happen. I think they are really by that for like Louisiana and uh, Arkansas. Uh, I have a, and I, I'm only mentioning this because I have a colleague who studies particularly Jewish homesteaders in North Dakota and the Devil's Lake area. And so I, I wonder if, it, because they could get their land a little bit cheaper, Homesteading reservation land. I'm not sure if these are your folks. Mm -hmm. that, that there might have been a a calculation that well, we keep this land cheap and we don't intend to stay on it. And then so reframing the idea of success and failure. I don't. Some were, but I don't think most of them were. I want, and this is the conflict. I'm I'm mm -hmm. I'm working on a paper on this right now. The men wanted that. Mm -hmm. I am going to farm this land because I can be a farmer and I can change the stereotype, and I can be a real man, and the wives hated it. With a passion for any number of reasons. I mean, oh my God, passionately. And they were the ones that convinced, nagged, use your words wisely, their husbands to stop doing this. They try running the farm without the female labor. Right, or someone to, to be at the homestead to, to protect it, right? I mean, the, the majority of these men loved this idea, though they were crappy at it. They loved it. The wives, oh my gosh. It was a frightening, non-Jewish place to be. There were natives. There were snakes. There was no doctor. There was no way to get kosher food. I mean, the list goes on and on. They, they were out of there as fast as they could be. Except for Devil's Love. And I guess uh, the, the borderland, the borderlands point too. I guess there, there are layers of borderlands as well. Because if you have a, a Jewish community settling near in, or on, in some cases, uh, Indian reservations, uh, it's Midwest Great Plains, and then there's this cultural frontier interaction. Uh, that's interesting. I <laughs> Can I just say that uh, Jake is part of a new book published by University of Nebraska Press about homesteading. And I cannot emphasize how important this book is because for about 50 years, we all relied on these old Fred Shannon interpretations of homesteading that were terrible. They were totally wrong. 
and uh, Jake and I were just talking, one of the guys who got it right was Gilbert Fight, the agricultural historian, who actually looked at the numbers and found that, yeah, most homesteaders did succeed. These numbers that uh, Fred Shannon were using were wrong, but it took Jake and uh, Rick Edwards at the Great Plains Study Center uh, and uh, Rebecca Wingo to put all this into a book so we can rethink how successful the homesteading process was. Anybody else for the good of the order, Brad? Yeah, John, so you said starting out this as framed as we want to be in dialogue with the Western historians, and uh, I wonder what they would say about, you know, when you also framed it and you started, there's a pretty distinct conflict that conflict maybe is too between the southern border, the Midwest, and the south and the Midwest. Okay, that's clear. Wow, we fought a war over some of this, and that just seems pretty clear. The East still has some clear cultural, geographical, and political tendencies. And, and then this is a challenge, and you tackle the book that I have not read or forward to looking at. It, how do you, it, it feels still very somewhat amorphous to me about the land, it, it, it's which of the factors involved in a borderland would you find most compelling? Is it a landscape geography one? Is it a political economy or is it a culture one between Plains and Midwest? You know, um, which of the, or am I oversimplifying what I, is really a complex world? Well, it's complex, but I would start with the land, topography, geography, geography. and water. Right. Um, once you pass the 100th Meridian, that's why I wondered why no one brought up Wallace Stegner. I mean, this is the key thing. Once you get past that 20 inch rainfall line, it gets rough. It's hard to make it as a farmer out there. So people turn to ranching, either that or people don't start farming, or it remains open prairie. It's very, very susceptible to droughts. Um, so it's a it's a different kettle of fish. And the then that results in the culture and the political and the other differences that we might see. Or is so I can I just pick yeah. up so going to the political, what I think if you look at Native American history, for example, you see tribal peoples actually decentralizing when they start getting to the 97th, 98th, 99th. That is so the, the Dakota and the Lakota peoples when they moved on to the plains actually their governmental system shrunk in size. They're, they went to bands, not what we might call nations like people like Iroquois. So you see, and you see this in small communities as well. That is, it's a smaller community than it was on the East Coast. It might be, what, how many families? Was, I'm sorry, just three or four families, right, as opposed to 30 or 40 families. So, so you actually see government shrink in, in terms of size. It becomes, if you will, more direct. In, in certain ways. So there is a, a political change that you see, but you have to look not at the macro, that is not at governmental structures, mm -hmm. but at kind of the operational side of, of how does it operate. But I think that that would be a, a, a way to kind of get it. The environment does force these changes, and it takes a while to adapt to these changes. Um, and, and so there is a political difference, I think, between the Midwest and the West, but we're, but we're just kind of getting there. Culturally, though, find that the uh, uh, plains going into the Black Hills that, that stayed the same. Uh, Paul Whiteman, uh, the, the jazz person, came out of Denver, cowboy land, uh, uh, not. And so the cultural, we got to look at the cultural changes as independent of just the geography. What other they're not angle on this on terms of Native Americans is, uh, and there's a chapter here by Joe Schiller about this, uh, is the woodland Indians, say, of upper Midwest, uh, et cetera, versus the Plains Indians and the great regional distinctions you can draw using their experiences and the difficulties of uh, the natives of the upper Midwest who were forced to move out to, say, Crow Creek and what a culture shock that was. Um, and you can draw a lot of regional distinctions based on that. I think it's great that you're wrestling with this. One more question on the title, Interior Borderlands. Wow, that is compelling in some ways, but also contradictory. So normally when we think of borderlands, we either think of national, either cultural, like you know, uh, South Texas where, uh, you know, Gloria 
Anzaldúa, Anza, 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 yeah. Anza, you know, that's kind of the classic board. That's where it all kind of starts, at least in the North American context, although there is also Christian European board. So, what, how did you come to that title, and what does it say about what you were trying to do? Well, the reason for the title is, in contrast to, say, the Texas Mexico border, which is a national border. Yeah. Right? And uh, they're. But also a cultural one and a you know, clear yeah. flash. But in this case, this is not uh, a border between nations. It's an interior border. It's an interior place where regions differentiate themselves. That's the, yeah. that's yeah, the yeah, yeah. magic yeah. behind the title. I think David says in his piece, no state boundaries. Yeah, right. I mean, one of the books is uh, Southwest Minnesota, a place of many places, right? And it, it's always, always divvied up. But I've, I've been thinking, you know, it's been that way forever and ever and ever, and there was no Germany. I've heard Germans say, well, that guy's from Saxony, swine, you know, and, and, and my, my Italian mother's family, they were all married, uh, wigged out because some of the nephew was going to marry a wop. And my sister says, well, isn't that what we are when we wops? Well, we're not wops, we are Tuscans, you know, and there's no Italian and there's no German, and you get all this, there, there's always been all these divides, and even religiously, I mean, there were... Uh, you know, the, the, the American Germans, and then there were Lutherans, and then there were the German Lutherans, and the Danish Lutherans, and the Norwegian, they all had their separate churches, and don't go over there, and it, it's always subdivided and bordered. Andrew? I just want to, I'm really enjoying the conversation and, and thinking about this, and I wonder, you mentioned the environment um, as a spot, but it sounds like culturally there's a different way we're drawing lines, and I wonder if this whole conversation kind of highlights the fact that there are different registers um, on which these, or across which these different regions uh, have that border. So maybe Southwest Minnesota is a border when we talk about thinking about place, but the 100th Meridian is environmentally one. And so how do we balance maybe a religious borderland that happens at a different place and a cultural or literary borderland that happens in a different place and environment, you know, so it sounds like these borderlands are not always in the same spot, but they're crossing, you know, there's similar board regions being bridged. You know, does that make some sense? I, I don't know where to go with that, but it's... Why not? Why, why do we have to justify it? Why can't we just say there are yeah. these different borders? It's what they, we do in the Ozarks, yeah. right? There's the cultural Ozarks, which is larger than the geographic Ozarks. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so, I mean, I I is this yeah. a problem? Why do we have... This is social science, I'm sorry, not hard science. I come from a house of hard scientists, so you know, I'm always shut in the corner. Um, so it's, it's, it's a soft science. So why can't we have these multiple borders? I, that's what intrigued me about the book, was the idea that there's no border. It's borders, mm -hmm. and, and they, they, they change, and they, they mush. I mean, what is, what is Missouri? Is Missouri Midwest? Is Missouri South? As I sit as, as a scholar of the Ozarks, I'm always making the argument, I'm in Missouri Ozarks, so we're Midwest, but wait a minute, I'm in the Ozarks, so we're the Ozarks, but you can't divide the Ozarks, so it must be the South. So I, I fall under multiple categories, is that a problem? No. This is for me. No, I mean, so I think, I think it's okay to just say we have these different <coughs> boundaries. And they differ over time. Right. Uh, here's a great example of this. If you go back 100 years ago, you can find a very stark borderline between corn country and wheat country <coughs> based on rainfall and you know the soils, etc. Um, and they draw a very stark uh, line between the regions. But now, because of technology, because of the power of hybrid seeds, etc., you see corn growing out West River, South Dakota, West River, yeah. almost to the Black Hills. Uh, would have, which would have been unheard of 100 years ago. So these things change and they migrate and they shift around. That's what makes it interesting. To throw things really into confusion, I mean, I think borderlands even form and disintegrate every day. I mean, diurnally, you see the pattern and you see it in, in all our, our ethnic grocery stores. So, so look at how, for example, and, it, and it's not just now in Chicago or larger cities. Even in, in smaller cities, you see you know, somebody going in, say, to a Middle Eastern restaurant, and so between nine in the morning to about nine at night, you have an enclave there that's very a lot, and then 
uh, say, the, the white folks go back to their suburban houses, and so the, the borderland dissipates, but it's diurnal. It, it's, I mean, this is the, like the ultimate food, creates one of the ultimate borderlands in our urban landscapes. All right, we better wrap up. We're over time. Thank you, everyone, for coming.